And a Christian greeting to each one listening here and all those that are listening out there that are not here. May the Lord be praised today as we worship together. Thankful again for those thoughts of remembering. The older I get, the more precious some of those things are that I remember from way back there. Um, I can't live over when I'm a young boy, but I can remember. And they're precious to us. Things that established our goings. What a blessing that is. May we continue to do that and be refreshed through remembrance. Thank you for those thoughts. This morning, for a message, something that I've been thinking about all week, um, I've entitled the message, The Poor of the Land. And it's a part of 2 Kings 25, 12. Um, Last week I read the alms scripture and also the feet washing scripture, but that's been pressing on my mind this week already, that of giving of alms. It speaks of having compassion on the poor and needy and how to do it in a way that could be a blessing for both the giver and the receiver. I'd like to look at the subject of the poor in the land this morning. It was a, is it a blessing or a curse? If you'll turn with me to 2 Kings 25, verse 12, I'll just, if you can do that, I'll read that verse. And this verse has to do with the time when Jerusalem was taken captive over to Babylon. And the one who was, they had already been taken. Uh, the leaders and so forth had been taken, captured. Jerusalem had been um, overtaken, and uh, they had placed the captain of the guard there in Jerusalem. And it says there in verse twenty, er, in verse twelve, chapter twenty-five. But the captain of the guard left of the poor of the land in Jerusalem is what he's talking about, to be vine dressers and husbandmen. Now that's servanthood, basically. If you stop and you think about it, uh, those who were going to take care of the fruit or the fields and those areas of production around Jerusalem, they left those there. The rest of the princes and the skilled people were taken to Babylon to be killed or become servants of, the, of Nebuchadnezzar. Was this a blessing to be poor at that time? Physically poor? Well, at least they stayed in their home place, their home territory. Uh, they weren't killed. So in a sense, it was a type of blessing that they could remain there in Jerusalem area and they just had other people ruling over them. But they were, their lives were spared and they had food to eat, I'm sure, because they were taking care of the production. So there was not a need in those areas. But it seems to me, as I looked over this portion, that was what was on my mind this week, meditating upon alms and, and that it seems like that God had a sympathetic heart for the poor. And I'd like to look at some of those. I wanted to ver I made that statement last Sunday, and I wanted to verify some of that and began studying and looking at some of these scriptures that would verify the thought that God had a sympathetic heart for the poor. And if God has, why shouldn't we, is the question that I was asking myself. We notice in the beginning of time that he gave special attention to the physically poor, those that didn't have very much. <clears throat> Turn with me now to Deuteronomy 15. I'd like to read a portion from the very beginning and trying to get the thought of God's heart as we think of the physically poor. Deuteronomy 15 reading 
7 and 8. And there it says, these are the commandments that, were given, uh, that, Mo, uh, that was given to Moses. And if there be among you a poor man of one of thy brethren within any of thy gates in thy land, which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not harden thine heart, nor shut thine hand from thy poor neighbor or brother. But thou shalt open wide, open thine hand wide unto him, and shalt surely lend him sufficient for his need, in that which he wanteth. And then we can skip down to, or like to skip down to verse uh, 12. No, 10. Thou shalt surely give him, and thy, and thy heart shall not be grieved when thou givest unto him, because that for this thing the Lord thy God shall bless thee in all thy works, and in all that thou puttest thine hand unto. And I read some of those scriptures, I believe, last week. Bringing out the thought that it shouldn't grieve you as you do fulfill the command that was given. That it should be, and, and that gives us an indication, how do you give without grieving, or with grieving, is if you aren't really dedicated to what you're doing. You're just doing it because I'm supposed to. But God's saying the blessing rests if we have that sympathetic feeling toward that person and our heart goes out to them. And we want to share with those that are poor and meet their need. It's a blessing then for us, he tells us. <clears throat> also, if we would turn back to Exodus 23, I'm going to be reading a lot of scripture because that's what my focus was this, this week, is to find scriptures that would verify these uh, sharing and the sympathy that uh, God had toward poor and likewise we could challenge our own selves. Why am I not having the same kind of feelings? Exodus 23, I'd like to read verses 9 through 12. Also thou shalt not oppress a stranger, for ye know the heart of a stranger, seeing that you were strangers in the land of Egypt. And six years thou shalt sow the land, and gather in the fruits thereof. But the seventh year thou shalt let it rest, and lie still, that the poor of thy people may eat, and that they leave the beasts of the field and what they leave, the beasts of the field shall eat. In like manner thou shalt deal with thy vineyard and with thy oligard. Six days thou shalt do thy work, and on the seventh day thou shalt rest. That thine ox and thine ass may rest, and the son of thy handmaid, that the stranger may be refreshed. There's so many different things areas and categories that are entered in with the thought here along with that of feeling the need of the poor. It's talking about the land, giving them a rest or giving it a rest so that it could refresh. And during that restful time, the poor can have the opportunity to use your land that you have left lay because of commandment. Are you willing to do that? Is it, is it done grudgingly? Or are you glad to do that for them? It's something that was impressive to me. And not only that, he brings in how that from the Ten Commandments, we are to keep that one day, a special day, a day of rest. From the very beginning, there was creation, but then there was a day of rest, and that has a purpose. It's a refreshment to the body. We give our body some sympathy, and we don't overextend ourselves in a work ethic to where we don't rest. <clears throat> There's another thought that I just gained now. I remember uh, the uh, person that was not a church person I was working for him, Right after I went out of high school, I was with an excavator for the summer before I went into service. And uh, 
There was one thing I appreciated. We didn't work on Sunday, even though he was not a church-going man. He just said, made the statement, if I can't make a living six days, the seventh day is not going to help a bit. It's because of the attitude I have, and, and so or that he had, that we make it work, and, and it's a blessing. It's a time of refreshment for us that we need. And the seventh day would probably be a harm if he continued to work. So that's a thought he was getting uh, or trying to share. Leviticus, another avenue, uh, another thought in relation to uh, uh, God's sympathy for the poor. Leviticus 23, verse 22. There it says, and it mentions the leaving of the co uh, corners of your fields for the poor and the strangers. Oh, another thought I wanted to share there is in Exodus 23. Uh, it gives the indication that a stranger is also a poor person or considered in the poor realm. Why? Because, probably because he's, have you ever gone to a, a different place and you feel like you're a stranger? And, and, and okay, we were just last winter at a, at a uh, wedding and it was in a strange place. And, and my wife's sister's husband, they drove from Tennessee, but they had car trouble on the way up. And so he was in a strange land with car problems. Isn't it a healthy feeling to be able to look to those people and say, can you help us? Do you know someone who can fix my car? You know, there's a, a, a blessing in that of you're a type of poor person in a strange land. You don't know the people. You don't go to your normal car fixer. You go, you ask questions, and you try to find someone who will meet your need there. Same way with food and, and place to stay. Can you help us? What's the best place to stay? What's the best hotel? Or what's, where can I best meet my needs? Because I'm a stranger. We're a type of poor person. We need other people's help. That's kind of the secret of being a poor person, needing help. Leviticus tells us then, like I mentioned last week, that the corners of the field were not ye uh, reaped. Tells us very plainly in Leviticus 23, 22, that we're to let that for the poor people so that they have something to partake of and meet. Now, how sharp do you make the corn? Do you provide a little bit, or do you make it pretty round so that there's more there for the poor? Just some thoughts that we can transpose into our giving of, of uh, meeting the poor's needs. But God said, allow the corners of the field not to be reaped so that they have something to... Uh, live on and to meet their needs the poor of the land <clears throat> exodus 22:25 as another area that uh, is in relation to god's thoughts about the poor and i'm sure that we can carry that over into our day and age likewise Exodus 22, 25 says, If thou lend money to any of my people that is poor by thee, thou shalt not be to him as a usurer, neither shalt thou lay upon him usury. That's talking about charging interest to those that are poor. Um, or maybe even those that are in the congregation or in your fold. We can take that and reach out in many different ways. God tells us he's going to bless us if we, can, if we do that. There's another thought that I got out of that verse where it said, any of my people that is poor by thee. 
I'm not quite sure how that all goes, but maybe he, maybe you have done something and this person has an obligation to you. He's poor by you. But you don't hold him accountable. You don't require it. If he cannot pay it, are you willing to let it go? Poor by you. Of course, he's also saying don't charge interest to that poor person. God will take care of the rest. Just let's remember that. If we do that which God commands and we do it willingly, God's going to take care of it for us. And I've experienced that for myself already. God takes care of us in those ways and in those times. Now, there are those who probably sometimes have not experienced that. But uh, God is always true. We can read that on the board here. He's faithful. <clears throat> There's an exception that I'd like to point out in relation to the poor. That uh, the reason that people are sometimes poor, I'll get to that. That's not the thought I wanted to go here. There is, there's something here in Exodus 30, verse 15, I'd like to turn to and read. That's a few pages back. Exodus 30, verse 15. The rich shall not give more, and the poor shall not give less than half of a shekel. Then they shall, when they give an offering to the Lord to make atonement for their souls. We notice here that sometimes the poor feel we don't have very much. We're poor. We don't have it. We must be exempt from tithing or offer, giving offerings because we don't have very much. We don't have much to give. But it tells us here, the rich are not to exempt from it, nor the poor. So even the poor are to be tithing or giving offerings so that for the atonement for their souls. We notice in Leviticus, which gives a little bit more detail to the laws that God had given, in Leviticus 14, verses 21 and 22, it talks about a poor person that if he can't give the regular amount or what is required for that atonement offering, uh, he can give two turtle doves or two pigeons for a sin offering atonement. That which is common. He is to give something. He has to go out and catch these pigeons or turtle doves, even though it's very small or so on. It's something that they can do, but they are to give an offering. They are not exempt from it. Another thought that uh, I found very interesting uh, that God was giving to, in the commandments there if we borrow from a poor man, according to, if you borrow from a poor man, in Deuteronomy 24, verses 12 and 13, it says, Thou shalt return it at the end of the day. Interesting. Uh, reminds me of something that uh, someone shared at work many years ago where Someone had borrowed a neighbor's, I'm not sure, was it an axe or it was something that he had borrowed. And, and the borrower had not returned it. It was a long time. And, and, and the man wanted it. He needed his axe again or whatever it was. And so he went over to the neighbor and he looked in his shop and there was the axe and the neighbor was right in there so this other neighbor went out to the buggy and he got his whip 
And he went in there and he whipped that axe and he said, now the next time you return when you're finished being used. And then he took his axe and, and then the neighbor said, oh, I apologized and told him to take it home. But that's interesting that God says, thou shalt return it at the end of the day, a responsibility that was put upon you or me when I borrow something from a poor man. Deuteronomy, the same chapter, verses 14 and 15 says, if you hire a man, you're to pay him before the sun goes down. Now, we don't do that in this day and age, but the thought there was that he might need that money that day. So pay him so that he has it. <clears throat> Honor the poor man and respect him. Meet his needs in the best way possible. It seems quite obvious that God's heart reaches out to a poor person. A question I'd like to ask, is there a greater reason than the suffering that goes with natural poverty that God had in mind? Could it be that there is a better willingness of a person to accept help that's poor? Maybe an attitude difference that God was looking at when he was giving these rules in relation to the poor. That could be to both the poor man or to the one who is meeting that need. Now the question that kept going through my mind all week, who are the poor? Is it just the physically poor? Or is there some other poorness that's important? And I'd like to look at, I think there is. And I'd like to look at the two different aspects of poor, that uh, the physically and also the spiritual aspect of being poor. In 1 Samuel 2.7, it says, The Lord maketh poor, and he maketh rich. He bringeth low, and he lifteth up. So we notice that it's God who is in charge of being poor or being rich. It sometimes has something to do with us, our attitudes, but uh, God is in charge of this because he's the one who bringeth low or lifteth up or makes poor and gives us the opportunity to be rich. We don't always understand why he does what he does. We need to trust him in all his doings. And one way to look, about, uh, look at that in an honest way is that we're humans and God is divine. And I don't understand all his divine purposes and ways. He can see far into the future and we can't. We try to and we make decisions in relation to to the best of our knowledge in those ways. But we sometimes fail. But he never does. John 1, 9. I like to think of that uh, scripture as I think of not understanding the Lord's doings. And that's where a blind man, uh, they brought a blind man from birth to Jesus. And the disciples asked him, he said, Who sinned? This man or his parents, that this man was born blind. And then, of course, Jesus' answer was, no one, but, he, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. Here we again see that mankind had thought they understood why a difficulty comes in a person's life. And I know I've sometimes made judgments like that too and been totally wrong. And here they were totally wrong. And Jesus showed to them that he had a higher purpose. He had a greater mission to show to them or a greater thought to show to them. And that was that he wanted to make himself known as a healer. And he healed the blind man. 
Another verse that would verify some of these things or show us who the poor might be is Psalm 72, verse 12, where he says, For he shall deliver the needy whom he, pardon me, for he shall deliver the needy when he crieth, the poor also, and him that hath no helper. No helper. Maybe he's poor because he's been taken advantage of or has no one to plead his cause, to stand up for him, to be by his side. There's a scripture I left out that talks about God being by our side. I just now remember it and I failed to write it down, but in Psalms it talks about being God being by our side. A thought that goes along with this having a helper, being by our side and meeting our need, uplifting us, giving us strength. The poor have no helper. They're often by themselves, alone. Psalm 74, 21 gives us another hint of a person who might be poor. Oh, let him not be oppressed. Return Oh, let not the oppressed return ashamed. Let the poor and needy praise thy name. As I think of the oppressed, often the poor are those that are looked down on. Uh, where was the beggar found in the scriptures? At the rich man's gate. There he sat, hoping to receive from the rich people that go in to see the rich man oppressed. Talks about the dogs coming and licking his sores because he was full of sores. Oppressed. Does our heart go out to those, the poor and needy? They praise thy name. I had to think of just recent story that we heard in the Ukraine. And I think of, uh, of uh, another thought, the verse before verse 21, verse 20 talks about those that are treated in cruelty. Cruelty can cause poverty, and we don't have to think very long in the Ukraine, and we see that that's very true. But we think of someone who uh, had... Uh, there was a story that come from, and the reason we know is because these people were praising God. They were being oppressed, and they had very little. They were hiding in the basement, and they had one bottle of water and some crackers. I think it was what it was. And they were down there for two or three weeks. And when it was over with, they still had a bottle of water and crackers. They were praising God because there was a miracle there. And I had to wonder already in that one town where they've completely destroyed it. And there's, what is it, somewhere around 2,000 people in that factory down in the tunnels. And they have given up trying to get them because the Russian soldiers are afraid that uh, there be, they'd lose too many soldiers if they go down there to try and weed them out. They've been in there for a long time. What are they eating? What are they drinking? Is God providing a miracle there? I believe something is happening. It wouldn't take long until the food's all gone for 2,000 people. And yet, God's name is being praised as we think that thing through. We don't know the statistics. Maybe sometime we will, but right now we don't. But it makes you wonder, is God providing there? adding more fish and loaves, multiplying it. <clears throat> Psalm 82, verse 3, talks about, says, defend the poor and the fatherless. I think that's another clue about those that are poor. That's the fatherless. True religion Undefiled before God is to visit the poor and the, uh, the uh, 
fatherless. Can't get it. It's not in my notes here. But anyhow, the fatherless are included in God's heart there in those that are of the poor, quote. Now there is another thought that we need to look at in relation to poor. And there's the thought there that poverty, uh, there can be a poverty that a person has created. <clears throat> in Proverbs 6, I'd like to turn to and read that this morning. Proverbs 6, <clears throat> I'll be reading verses 9 through 11 in relation to uh, a poverty that I might be able to create myself. <clears throat> Beginning in verse 9 in chapter 6. How long wilt thou sleep, O sluggard? When wilt thou arise out of thy sleep? Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. So shall poverty come as one that tra traveleth, and thy want as an armed man. We see here that a lazy person is bound to suffer poverty. The folding of the hands tells me, or I get the thought that indicates a lack of ambition. Just, just not having a desire. And when we have that kind of a desire, we're, we're not going to produce. It's not going to be a satisfaction. And so we just lay around. We don't, we like to stay in bed. That gets old for me. And it gets old for the body. Do you think that causes the body to deteriorate faster? Sure it does. Proverbs 10.4 <clears throat> tells us, that's just to back a little bit further. There it says very plainly, he becometh poor that dealeth with a slack hand, but the hand of the diligent maketh rich. Using the term slack hand of uh, not being useful, not just folding the hands. Not having ambition, just poverty. And, and then uh, as we think of that uh, uh, slack hand, other sources will say slothful, which gives another different definition for um, the one who is a lazy person who doesn't want to work. It's not healthy, it's not good, and he's going to be a poor person. We have made ourselves poor in that way. Proverbs 13, verse 18, some more scriptures in relation to self-poverty. Poverty and shame shall be to him that refuses instruction, but he that regardeth reproof shall be honored. Not taking instruction is a way of poverty. Proverbs 25 Verse 4, I said unto the fools, deal not foolishly. Be wise in your investments that you make. Don't overextend yourself in your purchases, or there may come poverty. I said unto fools, deal not foolishly. Be wise. Allow room for emergencies is another area of wisdom in relation to uh, not dealing foolishly. And then yet, sometimes there are going to be those situations where we might need help to meet our needs or to uh, move forward. I'd like to look at some guidelines, just a few here, concerning the poor of your people. Psalm 41, verse 1 says, Blessed is he that considereth the poor. The Lord will deliver him in the time of trouble. God will take care of me if I consider the poor, is what he's saying there. 
Consider it in the NIV uses the word regard. Taking into consideration. I think of the real poor and not the deceivers. Now there were poor in Romania different times. And, and they were those who were beggars. Many times they would... I remember at the train station one time where we had gathered to send some, uh, allow a visitor to go back home again, and we as a church had come together, and there were many people there. And of course, this, this poor person came up, and he was limping. He could hardly walk, and he was wanting some funds. And one of the shop owners recognized the limping poor man, and he ran out, and he said, get out of here, and the man took off running. He wasn't lame at all. He was in, just indicating that he was lame so he could get funds. That's not the real poor. He wouldn't have run away. <clears throat> I'd like to look at one more scripture in relation to the poor there. Proverbs 21.13 says, Whoso stoppeth his ears at the cry of the poor, he also shall cry himself, but shall not be heard. Do we listen? Do we hear when the poor are crying? Do we take notice to give our attention to? Or do we turn away and make excuses for ourselves? The time may come when we might have a similar situation and we won't be heard. I need to move on. I'd like to move to God's gift of salvation is available to everyone that is poor in spirit. That's the spiritual aspect of it. And the, be, uh, the Beatitudes, it says, blessed are the poor in spirit for this, theirs is the kingdom of God. Uh, the, it's the criteria for a relationship with God. The Amplified Bible uses the word humble for the poor in spirit. Uh, Isaiah 57, 15 speaks of a contrite spirit, meaning a deep sorrow for having done wrong. Psalm 51, 17 indicates, indicates a broken spirit. Familiar with that Verse, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart God will not despise. Then in Psalm 37, 11, offers the term meekness for poor in spirit. The key verse I'd like to think of is in 2 Corinthians 8, 9, concerning the spiritual aspect of being poor in spirit. And there it says, for we know the great, and Paul was saying this, for we know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, he was the creator, yet for our sakes he became poor. He died, came to earth to die. That he might, uh, that ye might through his poverty might be rich. The forgiveness of sin for ourselves came because he became poor to meet our needs. He was rich, <clears throat> a superb example of the poor in spirit. The opposite of humility is pride. Pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall, Proverbs 16, 18. And then Proverbs 13, 7, it says, There is that which maketh rich, yet hath nothing. There is that which maketh himself poor, yet hath great riches. The parallel scripture there in the New Testament is Matthew 23, verse 12, where it says, And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. That is talking about being poor in spirit. James 4, 10 says, Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. In closing, I'd like to turn to Revelation and read a portion in Revelation 3. <clears throat> talking about the churches. <clears throat> Revelation 3, 
Revelation 3, reading verses 16 through 18. And a closing verse here. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing. And knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. Then his counsel, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that thy shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Natural poverty may not adversely affect our eternal destination, but it can, according to our attitude. But a spiritual relationship is a must if we desire to be with Jesus throughout eternity. We must be poor in spirit to have that relationship. Shall we kneel in prayer? Heavenly Father, we come before you. Lord, as you have spoken to our hearts, as we think of those that are needy around us, and we are a rich people. Any way you look at it, we know that. And you've blessed us. And you've blessed us for a reason. May we see that reason and open our hands wide unto the poor. Not only those around about us, but all around the world. There is a crying out of poor people that have lost everything. Poor people that don't know the Lord. Poor people that have failed you. God, may we reach out in the many different ways that we can through sending scriptures, through sending Bibles, through sending food, through sending funds to helping people that are doing these things and reaching out. Those that are even extending their, or putting their lives in danger to bring food and clothing and so forth to those that are held captive, Lord. May we support them in prayer and fasting, Lord. May you meet their needs. And we just pray, Lord, that you would open our hearts to a compassion as ever, never before, that we would use the resources that you have allowed us to have in a way that's profitable for thy kingdom in these latter days. In Jesus' name we pray with thanksgiving. Amen.